This hardened speed chuck has a D13 cam lock mount, but my lathe has a 1 and 3 quarter 8 threaded spindle, so we're going to need to make an adapter. Welcome back to Cloud42. I'm James. I picked up a Hardinch 5C speed chuck at the Barzi Summer Bash this year. It has a D13 cam lock mount, which of course my lathe does not. It has an oddball 1 and 3 quarter 8 threaded spindle nose. I took some quick measurements at the bash of the mounting geometry using a scale and decided I could probably make it work anyway. So here we are. This is the chuck that we need to mount on the lathe and this is a 3D printed replica of my spindle nose. I keep one of these around for just this type of application. Now the back of the chuck is a D13 interface. So it's got a short taper and three holes for studs. And these studs just thread in and they each have a little half moon opening and there are cams in a D13 spindle that would pull this in onto the taper and flush against the face. Of course, I don't have that, so I'm gonna build some kind of plate that threads onto my spindle. And the question is, how short can I make the stack up? Because I want as little stick out as I can and it really looks to me like I'm gonna be able to get the threads all the way down to the bottom of that taper. So let's go into the computer and see if we can come up with something. This is the design for the adapter that I came up with. It has the short taper and the three screws in the front to attach to the chuck. And then it has the register and one and three quarter eight thread on the back to interface with my spindle nose. Now the spindle nose on the Geo602 lathe actually has this uh, tapered flange and that's there for these locks to engage. These locks come with all of the chucks that come with the lathe and they just attach the backing plate to the spindle nose so that it can't unscrew during a sudden stop or if you want to run it in reverse. Though I probably wouldn't risk running it in reverse because it's not a positive stop. To get all the dimensions for the D13 chuck interface, there is a standard, and that standard is international standard ISO 702-2. Now, if you just go out and Google for ISO 702-2 PDF, you will struggle. You will find lots and lots of places that would like to sell it to you, but you won't find an actual copy of the PDF. However, if you do the same search with the DuckDuckGo search engine, you will find the PDF almost immediately. So use that information as you will. If we page down here a little bit in the document, there is a set of generic drawings for all of the different sizes of D1 cam lock spindles, and these all have generic dimensions like D3 for the bolt circle diameter and D4 for the outside dimension of the adapter. It does show us the angle down here, seven degrees, seven minutes and 30 seconds on one side of the taper, and then all of the necessary dimensions are in the table on the next page. We're working with a size three, so the outside, the large end of the taper is 53.975 millimeters, and all of the rest of the dimensions we need are here in the table. So I just started by creating a sketch, using all of those dimensions to lay everything out, and then extruding and extruding with a taper angle to create the geometry on this side, then just use the hole primitives to create the dimensions and the geometry on the other side, and then just added everything else that I needed to the model until I had the overall adapter I needed. And one thing I also added here are these flats on the sides. Those will be handy when we're actually machining this and it'll also allow this to be held in a vise if I don't wanna run it on the lathe. From this model, I created a set of drawings that we can use to actually make this out of a hunk of ductile iron in the shop. But before I do that, I would like to actually 3D print a model of this so that I can do a test fit and make sure I haven't screwed anything up before I spend several hours making dust and chips on the lathe. And here's the test print. This is printed in matte PLA on the Bamboo Lab P1S. We'll try it first on the spindle nose. The thread seems to be the right size. The register seems to go in, but it's starting to stick, and this is pretty typical with threaded parts printed in PLA. They tend to gall on one another. I'm going to call that good. I'm not going to force it all the way in and, and get it stuck. Now, the taper seems to fit pretty well. I feel no play, and it kind of sticks a little bit in the bore. I'll make sure that the bolt hole circle lines up. This is the thing I was most worried about, that there'd be a minor dimensional difference here. But that seems pretty good, and the bolt heads are below the surface so they won't interfere with the flange on the spindle. 
spindle locks fit. You can see these clamp down onto this little tapered flange on the spindle nose. I'm not going to force it in there because I'd have to screw it all the way in. But that looks pretty good. I think we're ready to go make one of these. I picked up some four inch diameter ductile iron from McMaster Car. I'll cut off a hunk and get started at the lathe. Okay, I lied. It's not four inches in diameter. It's three and three quarters inches. Just took it over to the bandsaw, cut off a slice that's a little bit thicker than I need, and we will start by facing it off. Now I can already tell that this six bolt clamp that I made for the compound on this lathe is making a huge difference. That cut was way smoother than I've ever seen this lathe run with the compound on it. Now to punch out the majority of the material in here, we're going to use an annular cutter, and I'm just holding it in a three quarter inch boring bar block. Now I don't have this perfectly centered. I'm just sort of fishing around for the center and seeing where the circle ends up, where it cuts, and then moving the tool in and out and up and down until it seems pretty much centered in that. And then we're just gonna go for it. The annular cutter is pretty forgiving in this respect. Finally got it in there, engaged the power feed at about two thou per rev and just let it run. Unfortunately, that didn't work very well. I did not stop the lathe, it stopped on its own, the VFD was overwhelmed and it just shut down, and this tool is really stuck. With some effort, I can get it out, and I'm pretty sure all that's happening is that these little C-shaped curly chips from the ductile iron are just packing up in the tool and not clearing properly until it jams. So the solution turns out to be to peck, and since I've got this on the carriage and not in the tailstock, that's pretty easy to do. So I'll just work my way through till we break through. Now this removes material way faster than I could on this lathe with a drill followed by a bunch of boring and it leaves a nice little slug that I can do something else with in the future. Now that was the biggest annular cutter I had that was still smaller than the hole I need so now it's time for the boring bar and we'll just make pass after pass and bring this out to the correct dimension. I already set my DRO with a caliper, and then when we get close, I'll take the last two cuts at about the same depth. So if I need 60 thou, I'll take a 30 thou cut, and then we'll stop and measure and see where we are, and then set the DRO and take the last cut. To measure this, I'm using a three-point internal mic. These ones are from Shars. Uh, Shars is a supporter of the channel. These They sent me these to try, and I just love these things. You just put the tool in, turn the dial till it clicks, and it gives you the dimension. So I set the DRO to that value, then dialed out to my desired bore. I'll take the final cut, and we'll see where we end up. This nice and clean. Bring in the three-point internal mic. This is supposed to be one inch 627. And... 1 inch 627 right on the nose. Let me take another measurement a little bit deeper in the bore. And that's right on. What is that, 50 millionths difference? Have I mentioned that I love these internal mics? Now with the minor diameter board, we'll switch over to threading. I'm just going to put some blue Sharpie in here so I can see my scratch pass. I'll touch off with my threading bar, take a couple thou, and make a pass. Now, with the electronic lead screw on this lathe, I don't really need to do the scratch pass, but it's just habit, and the first time I screw something up and I don't take one, I will regret it. Got my thread gauge here, and that looks like eight threads per inch, so now I just need to start taking passes. Now, because I'm using the compound, I'm feeding down the flank. This is an eight TPI thread, meaning that both the width and the length of the flank are 125 thou, so I figured, I'll just feed down the flank till I get to maybe 90 thou, and I'll start checking then. Unfortunately, what I didn't think about is that the minor diameter isn't the theoretical sharp minor diameter. It's actually larger than that, and I didn't take that into account. My thinking was wrong, and 90 thou turned out to be too much, and this thing is already overboard. Those look like they come to a sharp point, which they shouldn't. And when I put in my metal replica of my spindle nose for testing, this thing has got way too much play. So, yep, that part is scrapped. 
Now, the good news is that the lathe with the new compound clamp is behaving way better than it used to. I can take, you know, 10 thou passes pretty much all the way to the end of the thread with no chatter. This is a whole new lathe with that. Now, the bad news is I get to do it all again. Whenever I buy material for a project, I always buy at least twice as much as I need for exactly this kind of scenario. So cut off another hunk, put it in the lathe, face it off. Drill it out, bore it to size, and uh, didn't hit it quite as close this time, but it's plenty close for the minor diameter of a thread. We'll thread it, and this time I will stop early and start testing. And it turns out it needed about 72 thou feed down the flank in order to get to a finished thread size. Now you note there's a tiny bit of play there, but that's exactly what I want because I don't want this bound up on the thread, I want it to feed onto the register and align properly on the spindle nose. And you need a little bit of play in the thread for that to work properly. Now to bore out the register, I'll just touch off with a boring bar and just bore out to the correct length here. Now this is another scenario where previously with this compound, with a little interrupted cut like this, you could see the boring bar diving. And I'm not seeing any of that. I'm not seeing any of the chatter that I've seen previously. This is working really well. Now I'll do exactly the same thing. I started measuring with calipers, get down, split the last cut, take the first of the two final equal cuts, measure with the three point internal micrometer, dial in with the DRO and take the final cut. And then on all of the previous passes, I've stopped maybe five or 10 thou shy of the final depth here. So on the last pass, I'll feed by hand to exactly the right dimension on the DRO and then wind the bar in to get a nice clean face. And then I'll bring out the threading bar just to put some chamfers here. Chamfer on the outside and then a chamfer at the start of the thread. You hear there was a tiny bit of chatter there, but there was a lot of stick out and a lot of engagement. So I think that's fine on a lathe this size. Do the final test with the register, and that aligns and seats beautifully. I think that is going to work, but the acid test is to check it on the spindle. So I'll pull the entire chuck and workpiece off at once. So I could put it back on if I need to keep cutting, and then we'll test the workpiece on the spindle nose. And that spins on beautifully. So since it fits, I'll go ahead and take the chuck off. And I'm gonna do the rest of the machining with the part on the spindle nose. So I'll just use a chain wrench here just to snug it down, make sure it's nice and tight since I don't have the inertia of a chuck to lock it into place. And we'll start machining from here. First operation in this setup is just to face the part to length. And I'm just doing this in multiple passes, measuring with calipers between passes to get it down to the correct length. The carriage lock that I made for this lathe made this job a lot easier. Now the final length here only sticks out maybe 10 or 15 thou beyond the end of the spindle nose and the measurements worked out, but it does make it very hard to chamfer. So I figure I'll just touch the end of the spindle lightly. It's super hard. So the tool definitely won't dig in except that the tool dug in and actually machined the end of the spindle on my lathe. It, that's the first mark I've ever put into it, and there's nothing I can do about it now. It's not a functional surface. It's not going to hurt anything, but it, it hurt my ego. Yeah, that's going to be there forever. Oh, well. With the face done and with the part to length, the next operation is to actually turn this to the correct diameter, and I've got a whole bunch of overhang here. You can see I've got a small tool sticking way out of the tool holder. I've got the compound in at 90 degrees, extended as far as it will go. And this kind of cut is usually really problematic on this lathe. Again, the increased rigidity of that compound clamp is paying for itself. I just love the surface finish that I get on the ductile iron. I mean, it makes a massive mess, but the surface finish looks really good. This is supposed to be 92 millimeters, and it looks like that measurement says we're under by a hundredth of a millimeter. That's pretty good. Maybe two hundredths of a millimeter. I mean, it's less than a thou. I will take that any day. 
That's all the lathe work for now. So we'll take this over to the mill, clamp it vertically in the vise, and mill the flat sides on the part. I'm using a three quarter inch insert end mill for this. It does a pretty nice job for this kind of operation. And I'm just going to raise the knee and touch off to establish my zero. So I'm looking for the point where it just touches but doesn't actually cut. So I'll raise the knee until I see it start to mark the part and then I'll work it back and forth in Y while I work the knee up and down. I'm looking for the point where the tool just polishes the surface but doesn't actually cut it. Everything I'm touching here is going to be machined away so it's not going to matter. And then I'll just raise the knee and start taking passes. I could probably get really aggressive with this, but because of the way it's clamped, I don't want to roll it, and I've got a lot of work into the part already. So I'll just take it easy, do this in multiple passes until I've raised the knee three and a half millimeters. Then I'll take it out, deburr this with the NSK pencil grinder with a small burr. And then I will put it back in the vise, flipped over with the flat side that we just milled, sitting on parallels, and do exactly the same operation. And again, the, the precise zero, the precise dimension here isn't nearly as important as it is that it be exactly equal on both sides so the part's symmetric and balanced. And that looks pretty good. Love the finish that that leaves. Deburr the other side, and then we can set this up horizontally in the vise, clamping using the two flat sides that we just machined. To put the holes in the part for the fasteners, I'm going to use the bolt circle feature of my DRO, but I need to center up first. And so I'm going to get a rough center by using the drill chuck, the taper on the outside of the drill chuck, just visually in the hole. It's remarkable how close you can get with this kind of an operation. And then I'll bring in a dial indicator and center up on the outside diameter. I don't want to center up on the register that I bored because that was done in op one. The outside diameter of the part was actually turned in op two with this installed on the spindle. So it's going to be absolutely true with the way the part will actually run when it's installed on the lathe. So I want to use that as my center reference. Now this is interrupted, so I can't just spin it all the way around, but I can take opposite sides and I can check the top versus the bottom on one side and get this very, very, very close. Zero up the DRO, configure the bolt hole circle and start by spotting all of the holes. Now I'm using the 3D printed part just to make sure that that at least makes sense. This is just the sanity check or the idiot check. It looks good. So I'll go ahead and use the bolt circle function to work my way around and spot all of the holes. Do they really need to be spotted? No, because I'm using a big stiff drill for this. But this gives me a yet another opportunity to look at it visually and say, well, that doesn't look right and fix it before I've scrapped the part. And we'll go right to a clearance drill for the 7 16 20 fasteners. And we'll just push that all the way through. I'll start nice and light just to make sure it does center up properly in the spot and then start leaning on it and run it through. And this ductile iron just drills beautifully. Now it does generate quite a bit of heat, but it doesn't really make sense to use lubricant on this because there's so much carbon in it. It kind of self lubricates, but it does generate a fair bit of heat during this operation. So while I was doing some of the turning, when I got down to a dimension that was really critical, I had to let the part cool a little bit, but for the drilling here, that really doesn't matter. And as usual, the ductile iron does make a big mess. Not as bad as gray iron, but it's much better to clean it up with a vacuum than to try to sweep it or brush it or blow it away with compressed air. Now I've got a 7 16 inch counterbore here, and I'll just run this down, touch it off, lock the quill, then lower the knee a couple thou so it's not in contact, spin it up, and then I will raise the knee gradually to take the cut to the correct depth. And I'm just using the DRO on the knee to get to the depth that I have in my drawing. I know that's precisely what I need, and so I'll just trust the numbers, do all three holes, and see where we end up. And once again, the ductile iron makes a mess, but it machines beautifully.
Now, before I move anything and lose my zero, I do want to actually test with a real fastener. And yes, it's close, but it is below the surface. So grab a countersink here, deburr those edges. And that should be all the machining that we need to do in this setup. To mill the pockets for the spindle locks, we're going back to the vertical orientation, but this time I need to establish a zero. So I'll use the edge finder on the front and on the two sides with the half function on the DRO to find the center line, and then switch to a quarter inch carbide end mill to do the milling. This is a four flute coated end mill from Lakeshore Carbide. I'll just bring this down, touch the top, lock the quill, zero everything, and then lower the knee a couple thou, come off the front, and raise the knee for my depth of cut. I'm gonna take this in two passes. I'll start with just one diameter, so a quarter inch depth of cut, and I'm just gonna slot this straight back to maybe 10 thou shy of the width of the pocket. Then I'm gonna make sure that I've blown the chips out of the slot before I bring the cutter back forward so it doesn't try to suck them in and recut. I don't wanna jam anything up and break the tool. And then I'll move over to the left again, a few thou shy of the width of the pocket, and I'll just mill back. Now this is in the conventional milling direction, so the chips are clearing out ahead of the cutter, cutter and away from it. I'll mill across the back of the pocket and then mill back out. Now you can see I've got some dimensions written on the top of my vise with a Sharpie. Those are the dimensions I calculated that I need to drive to with the DRO to stay about 10 thou off of the walls of the pocket. Now I'll lower to the final depth of the pocket and do exactly the same thing. Mill a slot in the center and then conventional mill around the outside edge to remove the majority of the material. Again, I'm about 10 thou shy of my line. And then I will go to my line, or at least the position that I calculated, and I'll make one more pass to clean up the wall. So I'm taking it's between five and 10 thou down the left, across the back, and back out on the right. And that should leave the pocket two dimension. And because it's such a light cut with a carbide end mill, I didn't even measure it. I figured it would be fine and it'll be fine. And the last thing we need in the pocket is an M6 threaded hole. So I put in the drill chuck and we'll just put that in at the coordinates with the DRO. Push that through. Now I started out trying to power tap this. It ended up not really working very well. The same problem that we had with the annular cutter on the lathe occurred here. I thought this thing would just push right through, but partway in it stopped. I fought it and fought it and fought it and then did what I should have done in the first place and brought out a tap wrench. And it turns out this thing was well and truly jammed in the hole. I couldn't go forward or backwards. I had to work it for a little bit back and forth and finally get the chips that were jammed in there to fall out. Got the hole tapped and then came back with a countersink to put a little chamfer on the edge. Probably should have done the chamfer first, but it probably doesn't matter that much. So I'll flip the part over and do exactly the same thing and make another one of those on the other side. Fill out the pocket, make the final perimeter pass, drill the hole, chamfer it first this time, and now I will just start the tap with the spindle, back off the chuck, and do the tapping by hand. This way I can actually feel what's happening, and I'm much less likely to break a tap. Deburr those pockets again with the NSK pencil grinder, and this should be ready to go back over on the lathe. With the lock pockets milled, we're ready to put this back on the lathe and do the final machining of the taper. Now this should just screw right on and I'll just try to snap it and get it to bottom, and then put in the locks. Now, when you have the inertia of a chuck, you can actually make it bottom a little bit better and a little bit more consistently and make sure that it's actually locked on there rigidly. But the moment you start to cut, it's going to start to tighten. So I'm not really worried about it in this scenario. So now I just need to remove all the material and leave the taper in the center. 
And I'm going to do this in two steps. The first thing I'm going to do is just mill down and leave a shoulder at the major diameter of the taper, and then I will come back and actually cut the taper. And this is another really gnarly interrupted cut, and this new compound clamp is working great. Milling back into the corner like this is where the tool normally grabs and dives in, and on other chuck backing plates I've made, that's where I run into a lot of problems, and I didn't have any trouble. I think that is a winner. If you hear heavy breathing and banging in the background, that is my wife doing her strength training in the gym, which is over on the other side of the shop. To set up the angle of the compound for cutting the taper, I'm going to move the carriage left and right exactly two inches using the DRO, and I'm going to measure the deviation of the compound slide using a dial indicator. So I take my two inches, multiply it by the sine of the angle, 7 degrees, 7 minutes, 30 seconds, which is 7.125 degrees, and the answer I get is 0.2481 inches. So if I move the carriage left and right exactly two inches, the dial indicator should move 0.2481. So I've got it set up pretty much at the pivot point of the compound. I will move it exactly two inches using the carriage and measuring with the DRO, and then I will rotate the compound until I see my 0.2481. Now this is just approximate on the first pass. We'll move back to zero, and it's not quite exactly right. I'll move the cross slide to bring it back to zero, move my two inches, and then use a piece of copper to tap this in to 0.2481. Now we're a little bit closer, we'll go back to zero and it's closer, but I'll adjust it exactly to zero with the cross slide, move the two inches, tap again, and just keep moving back and forth. And after a few passes, there's my two inches and that looks real close to 0.2481. So I'll just go ahead and lock down the compound. And as long as you start measuring from sort of the center of the pivot point, this only takes three, four, maybe five passes to get there. And so now I can just start using the compound and feeding in along and cutting the taper. Now, ideally, if I did everything right, this taper is gonna intersect that back corner that's already there on the part because I already turned this down to the major diameter of the taper. But as I start getting close, I'm going to start actually checking the fit with the chuck. And yeah, we're not even close. And so I'll just keep working. I'm actually cutting in both directions. I'm finding it a little bit easier to put the tool in the back and then cut outward because then I won't accidentally overcut the length of the taper. And as that gets closer and closer to the back, it starts fitting better and better. So there I've got it. It fits. It's still a little bit of a gap, so I'll take another pass on the taper. You gotta be really careful because a tiny bit of material off the taper will make a big movement in Z. And sure enough, the taper is kind of grabbing, but it's fully in contact with that back plate. So the taper's not as tight as I'd like, but you can solve that problem by taking a narrow cut off of the face. So with a light cut off of the face, I can see that it is almost seating on the face when it's fully seated on the taper and that seems about right to me. I'd like it to have a tiny little gap that'll get sucked down with the screws so that it'll pull it tightly onto the taper. I think that's about right. I'll go ahead and put some chamfers on this and we'll take it over the bench and see if it fits. Of course, now that that outside diameter is machined, I'm going to use some aluminum can shims so I don't tear it up. Well, it sure looks like the Fusion model, but the real question is, does it fit? We'll set that in, get the taper seated, and then if I take a piece of paper it just kind of drags in the gap all the way around. It is dragging, and if I press down, it doesn't really increase the drag very much, so I figure that gap is probably about 4 thou, which 
think is probably about what I want, but we're going to have to install the screws and see if it pulls it down tight. I'm going to start just by running these down by hand and I can feel a little bit of compression as it draws down to the taper and then I can feel it bottom out. So I think that's good. I am going to use an impact and just kind of, this is on a light setting. So I'm just going to kind of snug it down and make sure they're tight just because it's sort of hard to hang on to the chuck. And I definitely cannot get the paper in there. I also tried this with the thinnest feeler gauge I have, which is a thou and a half and it wouldn't go in there. I can see no light. I think it's pulled down tight. So I think we're about right here. It's a little heavier now, so it's a little bit harder to manipulate, but that's the same as every other chuck that I have to install or remove from this lathe. Once you get the threads lined up, it spins on pretty easy. Now, as I'm getting to this point, I'm starting to realize I don't have anything to hang on to to tighten this down. There's no chuck key sockets. There's, there's nothing. There's no jaws. So I just clamped something in a collet so I could use the outer wheel for leverage, and that seemed to work. I'm noticing that I have blood on my thumb here. I've been wiping that up and wiping blood off of surfaces where I find it for the last 20 minutes. I have no idea what happened, but apparently I'm bleeding. Now I'm realizing that I can't unlock it. There's no, there's no break on this lathe, and I'm just realizing that's going to be a problem. We're going to have to deal with that. But I can use the hook spanner here to get this unlocked. And let me take out the collet and let's just spin this thing up empty and see how it looks. Well, that looks all right. Ran this up and down through the entire range of the VFD with the current belt setting that I have on here. It runs up to maybe 15, 1600 RPM and through that entire range, I didn't notice any vibration. Now I have seen vibration with some other unbalanced chucks before, but this one's running nice and smooth. Put the collet back in here and set this up with a gauge pin and see how it runs. It's not clamped very tightly, but honestly, I don't have a good feel for how tightly you have to clamp this. It feels okay. Let's put a dial indicator on it and see what the truth is. And that's about 3,000 total indicated run out. That's not awesome. I mean, this chuck has had a long, hard life, but I was honestly hoping for a little better than that. We're going to have to do some investigation and, and figure out exactly what's going on there. I didn't have this chucked very tightly. Let me get the hook spanner again and, and get this thing unlocked and get it reclamped a little tighter and see if it makes a difference. Now this is also a cheap import call it. There's all kinds of potential sources of variability here. So no, I'm seeing almost exactly the same. It's about 3000 total indicated run out. Now I fished around for a while here on the spindle nose. It's kind of a dirty surface, but it's running about two thou in the bore on that taper. It's running about four thou. I suspect that's a major source of the trouble out here on the body. We're running maybe a thou and a half on the back here. We're running maybe two thou, maybe two and a half. If I put the indicator right on the adapter I made, it's obviously it's an interrupted surface, but it's running dead true. So this isn't an issue with the threading or how the adapter is fitting on the spindle. We'll have to investigate that later, but for now, let's take some cuts and just see how this thing runs. Got a piece of half inch 1018 mild steel. And we'll lock this up and take a cut. And that seems to be running nice and smooth. It's a pretty light cut. We can try something a little bit heavier. This is maybe 40 thou off the diameter here. And that's running great. Just compared to what this kind of cut would be like in any of my other chucks, that's, that's fine. I'm not really noticing any difference. Not noticing any vibration. I'm not seeing the carbide tooling pushing the work back into the collet, even though it's not clamped very tightly. 
That seems to be working fine. Now, after playing with this for a while, I did eventually discover that you can just use the inertia to unlock it. Give it a little flick, yank on the wheel, and it will unlock. Tightening requires, you know, something to immobilize the spindle. You can't really do that with the inertia. You I mean, you can try, but you really need to hang on to it, and I need to address that. But this is working like any other collet chuck I've used. Take a little heavier facing cut here off the end. Yeah, that seems to be working fine. Now the wrist flick unlocking method seems to work okay. Yeah, that works great. I could definitely get used to that. Well, we've got another collet chuck. We need to investigate what's going on with the run out, but this thing is totally usable. As usual, that was way more work than I expected, but I'm reasonably happy with the result. If nothing else, it's nice to breathe new life into an old weathered piece of machinery. If you enjoyed this video or found it useful, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. If you're already a patron, thank you. You make it possible for me to do this. Thank you for watching.